During this lecture, we're going to be looking at the law in relation to voluntary manslaughter. Okay, now I'm hoping that everybody is about at this point in the course, if not a little bit further on. It would be really reassuring if we had a few people nodding um, and saying, yes, we're, we're there, Odette. Okay. Um, I've put just a couple of very basic learning outcomes for this lecture on the slide. Now, they're the same as they are in the course materials, but hopefully this lecture will serve really just to consolidate your knowledge and understanding of voluntary manslaughter. Um, during this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to pay particular attention to two partial defences, that is the partial defence of diminished responsibility, but also of uh, loss of self-control. Okay? The intention is that by the end of this session you should be really quite comfortable with the essential ingredients of those defences, but also feel as if faced with a problem question in the examination, which of course none of you are thinking about the exam, um, you'd be able to apply some of these principles and work through the uh, problem question in a logical manner. Now what I'm going to do as we go through this lecture is I'm going to try and keep it quite practical and quite, um, I guess, strategic in many ways, just to remind you of what you need to be doing if you are answering a problem question that deals with either of these partial defences and what you need to do and when. And then of course in the tutorials afterwards we'll have a go at applying some of these principles and, and hopefully you'll feel much more comfortable by the end of this session. Okay, so moving on, um, really just to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page um, not, of course, that I'm suggesting anybody could have already fallen a little bit behind with the very light reading material for criminal law. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of contextual information because, obviously, in order really to understand voluntary manslaughter, um, we need a little bit of background information. Um, I think it's probably prudent just to go all the way back to basics. Um, we are here dealing with a homicide offence. Homicide is really just an umbrella term, um, and it's a term which is used to describe a broad range of offences. Now, during the LLB here, you're not going to cover all homicide offences. You're going to focus on a handful of offences, and that's probably a good thing because you've got more than enough to worry about for now. Um, I think it's really important to recognise from the offset that we don't charge people with homicide. Um, the starting position, really, when we're dealing with homicide offences is to start with the most serious of those offences, which, of course, is murder. Murder is the most culpable homicide offence, and in very simple terms, murder is the unlawful killing of a human being uh, with intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. A very, very basic working definition of murder is an unlawful killing of a human being with intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. Now, you'll sometimes see the mens rea uh, element of the offence referred to as malice aforethought, but that just means intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. Okay? What I really want to do at this juncture is encourage you to start thinking about criminal law questions in a strategic and structured way because one of the most common criticisms that examiners make of students' responses in the exams is that they lack structure. And if your answer is lacking in structure, it's likely that you're going to be missing key elements or key ingredients of an offence or a defence. And if you miss out those elements, it stands to reason that you're likely to miss out on potential marks. Okay? So, I'm just going to skip forward a slide because what I've tried to do here for you is just give you a very basic visual illustration of a few questions that you can work through in the examination or in preparing for the examination or just consolidating your knowledge and understanding. If you're looking at a question where there's a dead body, okay, you can ask yourself a number of critical questions. For example, has the defendant caused the death of the victim? If the answer is yes, you then want to ask yourself, did the defendant intend to kill or cause grievous bodily harm? If the answer to that is yes, it may be that the defendant is guilty of murder. But you don't stop there. 
When you've got to that point, you need to think about the possible existence of both partial defences and general defences. Okay? So you can revisit this slide just to help you with your thinking process when you're working through some of the illustrations in the study materials. I've also popped on the next slide for you just a couple of critical questions, really, because with a, underneath those banners that we've just um, sort of looked at on the last slide, there are a few things that you want to automatically have jump to your mind, really. Um, in the first place, when you're dealing with issues relating to whether or not the defendant has killed the victim or is the cause of the victim's death, you want to be thinking immediately about issues in relation to factual and legal causation. But you also want to be thinking about the possibility of any intervening events. Okay? You also need to think about the intention of the defendant. Was it the defendant's intention to kill the victim? Okay? So you'll need to be thinking about issues in relation to direct and oblique intent. But you also, and in the last session when we met the very first time, we looked at issues in relation to the doctrine of transferred malice or transferred intent. Okay? So when you're dealing with mens rea elements, always ask yourself the question, is the victim the intended victim? Okay, and if it's not, you've got an opportunity to demonstrate that you understand the law in relation to transferred malice. Finally, do the facts of the question suggest that there may be either a partial or a general defence? And it's really, really important that you look at a criminal law problem question holistically. Okay? It's not just about constructing criminal liability. It's also about entertaining the possibility that there may be valid partial or general defences but also that the defendant may be liable for a lesser offence, okay? And what we'll do is we'll revisit the structure that I gave you all in the session when we met last time and see if we can make that work for you in the context of substantive material for this lecture. Okay, well, let's move on to the substantive material because time is against us. Um, <coughs> I've already mentioned to you the definition of murder, that being murder is the unlawful killing of a human being with malice of forethought or intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. When we're dealing with manslaughter, the actus reus is the same, okay? So we have an unlawful killing. Now, in the case of voluntary manslaughter, what is significant is that the defendant will have the requisite mens rea for murder. So the victim, uh, sorry, the defendant will have intended to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. Okay? So essentially, in the first instance, you should always be thinking about constructing liability for murder. Because it's from that point at which you consider the partial defences available under uh, the legislation. Okay? So the partial defences to murder are... Loss of self-control, diminished responsibility, and suicide pact. And on this LLB, we'll pay particular, and in this lecture, we'll pay particular attention to the first two, loss of control and diminished responsibility. Okay? I think it probably makes sense at this ju juncture just to ask um, the question, why is it that we would have these partial defences to murder? And actually, the reason why we have special partial defences to murder is that the sentence for murder is what? Yeah, it's a mandatory life sentence. And what that means is that the judge isn't in a position to take into consideration mitigating circumstances to mitigate the sentence itself. Mitigating factors might be taken into consideration in relation to the tariff that's set, but it's not going to actually mitigate the sentence per se. Okay, so if there are in existence uh, a set of circumstances, special circumstances, then what can happen is if a, de uh, if a defendant is able to successfully run one of these partial defences, what it effectively does is it results in a conviction for voluntary manslaughter. And what that means is suddenly the judge's hands are untied and the judge is able to pass 
a discretionary sentence, anything up to and including a life sentence. So you can see that there's, you know, in the context of homicide, in the context of murder, actually these partial defences are really, really important. And I'm sure as you've been reading some of the case law, you've appreciated that in particular in relation to um, victims of domestic violence and so forth, it would be incredibly harsh to impose a mandatory life sentence in some of the circumstances that you'll have been reading about. Okay. The scope of these defences, or partial defences, uh, was amended by the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. Um, the provisions are in force. Um, one quick aside to all of you, it is, as I'm sure you appreciate, critically important that you always use the most recent materials available. So the most recent edition of any textbook. Criminal law, in particular, is an area that moves incredibly rapidly. And if you're using an out-of-date textbook or relying on an out-of-date textbook, you can very easily miss significant developments in the law. And of course, your currency of knowledge is going to be examined in the summer examination. So make sure that you don't over-rely on materials that may be out-of-date. Always check the currency of your knowledge. And in fact, there's a great series of um, newsletters available on the VLE that just will keep you up-to-date with you know, new cases uh, and as legislation comes into, uh, comes into force. OK, we're going to start with diminished responsibility. Um, we are, of course looking at voluntary manslaughter. I probably ought to say, in the interest of completeness, there is another species of manslaughter, which is involuntary manslaughter. And involuntary manslaughter comes in a number of different species, just to confuse things very early in the morning. In terms of involuntary manslaughter, there are three species uh, of which we have constructive or unlawful act manslaughter, gross negligence manslaughter, and reckless manslaughter. Okay. What's significant about those species of manslaughter is that the mens rea will be different. Remember, once again, with voluntary manslaughter, the mens rea is as it is for the offence of murder. Okay? So the defendant intended to kill or cause serious bodily harm, grievous bodily harm. Okay? Right then, diminished responsibility. Legislation concerned Section 2 of the Homicide Act 1957 as substituted by Section 52 of the Coroners and Justices Act 2009. Okay? I get asked an awful lot um, whether you have to write out the whole title of the legislation in the exam. No, you can, of course, abbreviate it. I've given you an illustration of what a sensible abbreviation would be on the slide. It does save a little bit of time in the exam. Um, so you can save yourself a few moments writing the same thing out over and over again. But of course, in terms of coursework, uh, etc., it's always a good idea to make sure that you are giving the full title first before you move on to give an abbreviation. So in the first instance, always give the, first, uh, the full title. OK, really for the purposes of the students that might be watching um, on YouTube, I'm just going to read this slide out because they may not be able to see the slides. For any students that are watching on YouTube, you'll be able to download the slides from the Law's virtual learning environment anyway. Okay? Um, section 2.1 of the Homicide Act, as substituted by Section 52 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009, stipulates a person who kills or is party to the killing of another is not to be convicted of murder if the defendant was suffering from an abnormality of mental functioning, which arose from a recognised medical condition, substantially impaired the defendant's ability to do one or more of the things mentioned in subsection 1A, and C provides an explanation for the defendant's acts and omissions in doing or being party to a killing. So this is the key, this is the core of the defence, okay? You don't need to necessarily memorise that word for word. What you need to be able to do is you need to be able to pull out the constituent ingredients of that big spiel, if you like. Okay? Um, I've just popped the next section, so section 1A underneath there for you, which is probably on a separate slide. Okay? I'll not read that out just so that we can manage to get through the material. Now, what I've done for you on this next slide is just broken it down into something that's a little bit more digestible for you. Okay? So, effectively, when we're looking at diminished responsibility, 
we're looking for four essential ingredients. That is, the defence are going to have to convince the jury that these elements were present. Okay? In the first instance, there has to be an abnormality of mental functioning. Okay? And that has to arise from a recognised medical condition. It also has to have caused or has to have been a significant contributory factor in causing the defendant to act as he or she did in the killing. And that abnormality must have substantially impaired the defendant's liability. Okay? Now that information can see, seem quite a lot of information to deal with in the first instance. So what I would suggest that you do is rather than try to deal with all of that in one go, I would suggest that you break it down into those elements. So you're looking for four essential ingredients. Okay? And if we deal with those each in turn, we start with an abnormality of mental functioning. Okay? Now, the old law required proof of something that was known as abnormality of mind, okay, and the leading case there was the case of burn. The difficulty with this term was that it was really quite heavily criticised, uh, and it was quite heavily criticised because it was quite a vague and woolly term, but also significantly, and this isn't unusual to the criminal law, I ought to add, um, the term abnormality of mind didn't really sit particularly comfortable with modern psychiatric practice or necessarily medical practice, I should say. So there was a bit of a disconnect or an inconsistency between what medical practitioners would consider an abnormality of mind and what the criminal law was prepared to accept as an abnormality of mind. And it was these criticisms, really, that led to consideration of a broader term. Okay? And this broader term is abnormality of mental functioning. Okay. What I've done for you on this slide is I've just given you, and it's by no means an exhaustive list, a couple of illustrations of what would fall under that banner, okay, of abnormality of mental functioning. I think all the slides, of, uh, all the students are frantically turning over their handouts here uh, just to look at the next slide, okay? Now... The next thing that we need to be satisfied, so once you're satisfied that there is an abnormality of men, uh, mental functioning, you next have to be satisfied that it is the result of a recognised medical condition. Now, I've popped on the slide here um, that the Act doesn't actually say that it has to be a definition accepted by a particular, uh, you know, a particular area of practice, so, um, you know, the GMC or whatever, uh, or a particular regulatory body. Um, I guess it, it's deliberately intended to be quite broad to encompass a number of sort of uh, ways in which mental illnesses can be classified or um, mental functioning can be classified, okay? You can see the second bullet point on these slides just goes through a few illustrations of what might again fall under that rather broad terminology. Okay. The third element that you need to satisfy, and you've got to do this every time you face a question in which diminished responsibility might be an issue. So you can't skip back and forth. You have to satisfy each element of the defence, each ingredient of the defence. If you don't, you're going to miss out on potential marks. Okay? So, the defendant's uh, mental functioning, mental abnormality, must have caused or have been a significant contributory factor in causing the defendant to act as he or she did, okay? I'm not entirely sure whether you're actually allowed to take a statute book into the examination, are you? Yeah, no, you are allowed to take it. So that being the case, if you are allowed to take a statute book into the examination, what I would say is be very, very cautious. What you don't want to be doing in the examination is copying out huge sections of the statute, because I can promise you you'll get very few marks if you do that. <laughs> it's not difficult to copy sections out. That's why I've broken that section down 
into the four elements because they'll be easy for you to remember and actually in reality it's easier for you to remember and quicker for you to remember those four constituent elements than it probably is to leaf through your statute book under examination conditions. The last thing you want to be doing is trying to locate substantive material, you know, when the clock's ticking, okay? So, these are uh, the way, ways, if you will, in which the defendant's um, impairment can be affected. So, it may be affected in as much as the defendant's ability to understand the nature of the conduct, their own conduct, what they're doing. Okay? It may be affected in terms of the defendant's ability just to exercise rational judgment. But it could also be affected in as much as it affects the defendant's ability to exercise self-control. And what you'll find in the study materials is there are a range of illustrations offered uh, that have been taken from the Law Commission report that illustrate really what sort of situations they would apply to, okay? This slide here really is just to remind you that there must be a causal connection between the mental, uh, the abnormality of mental functioning and the defendant's ability to exercise self-control or appreciate what they're doing, okay? So there has to be a causal connection between the abnormality of mind um, sorry, not the abnormality of mind, the abnormality and the killing, okay? has to be more than a merely trivial factor. Okay. Quite a lot of information thrown at you already, okay? One of my top tips for dealing with partial defences in particular, uh, if you're tackling a question on voluntary manslaughter in the examination, is to make sure that you address issues in relation to the burden and standard of proof. Okay? I can tell you that the vast majority of students in the exams tend not to complete this aspect of constructing liability and exercising their way through the defence. They sort of stop at the last ingredient, if you like. It is really, really important that you demonstrate to the examiner that you're aware that there may be a chif shift in the burden of proof but there also may be a change in the standard of proof, okay? And actually, because by and large, the vast majority of students forget this last sort of finishing touch, if you like, to their answer, it's a really good way to pick up some additional marks and demonstrate that your knowledge and understanding is complete, okay? And again, it comes back to structure as well, that you're logically and methodically progressing your way through all of the elements of liability in constructing liability and all the elements that are relevant in terms of the mm -hmm. defence. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Right. Okay, quite a fast pace here, just trying to keep an eye on how we're doing for time. Okay, so the second partial defence that you need to be aware of is the defence of loss of self-control. Now, anybody that happens to have in their possession a slightly older textbook uh, might at this point feel a little bit inclined to get a bit confused with um, provocation. It's really, really important that you're aware that the law in this area has changed significantly. So what you don't want is to make a slip of the tongue in the examination and revert to terminology uh, in terms of provocation, okay? So even I have to remind myself that I'm not talking about provocation. We're talking about the defense of loss of self-control, which I keep shortening to loss of control. <laughs> so you're in good company if you do the same, okay? So this is essentially a new partial defense. And it's a new partial defense to a charge of murder, okay? This is really important, and I'm going to stress this. These partial defences are only applicable to a charge of murder. A common mistake that students make is that they will go on to apply these partial defences, or at least attempt to apply these partial defences, to other offences against the person, okay? Do not do that, please, okay? Only when dealing with murder do you raise these partial defences. Okay, so we're looking at um, originally Section 3 of the 1957 Homicide Act, 
but it has now been replaced by section 54.1 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. Okay? And once again, your statute book will set out uh, the ambit of the legislation, the provision of the partial defence. And your job really is not to copy all this out word for word in the examination, but to tease out the constituent ingredients or the constituent elements. Okay? Nobody expects you to be a walking encyclopedia. No lawyer is a walking encyclopedia. Well, there might be one or two notable exceptions. But by and large, we're allowed to have reference to books. Okay? We're allowed to look you know, the fine detail up. What you need to remember is the core elements that you need to be certain are present when you're dealing with a problem question. Okay? So what are the elements that we need to be happy are in existence um, when we're dealing with loss of control? Okay, well, section 54.1, and this is for the purposes of students that may be watching uh, this lecture, stipulates the following. Where a person kills or is party to the killing of another, the defendant is not to be convicted of murder if, A, the defendant's acts and omissions in doing or being party to the killing resulted from the defendant's loss of self-control. B, the loss of self-control had a qualifying trigger. And C, a person of the defendant's sex and age with a normal degree of tolerance and self-restraint and in the circumstances of D, might have reacted in the same or a similar way to the defendant. Once again, lots of detail there. You don't need to memorise it. Okay? You just need to pull out the core elements. And essentially here, in the context of uh, Section 54.1, what we've got is three critical elements that we've got to be comfortable, got to be confident are present in the situation that we're dealing with. Okay? So... Once again, just for the purposes of consolidation, really, um, if a defendant successfully pleads uh, loss of self-control, what will happen is the conviction will be reduced to one of voluntary manslaughter. Okay? And once again, that gives discretion in sentencing. So what are the requirements of this particular defence? Well, again, just break it down into what you can keep in your head. Okay? Don't worry about the extra padding, the extra terminology in the Act. We need a loss of self-control. We need a loss of self-control that has a qualifying trigger. So any old thing isn't going to suffice. And there is an objective test. Now, in order to succeed with this defence, the defence need to establish each constituent element. Okay? If one element isn't present, the defence is not going to succeed. Okay? So the first element that we need to be certain is in existence is that the defendant has suffered a loss of control, a loss of self-control. Okay? Now, in looking at the case law surrounding this area, um, certainly the old case law in relation to provocation, that loss of control does not need to have been sudden. Okay? Having said that, there are a few common sense factors here. If, for example, the defendant has suffered a loss of self-control, there needs to be a sort of reasonable delay between the qualifying trigger, the thing that caused them to lose self-control, and their reaction. Okay? Now that is evidential really, that's for the ju jury to worry about, because if you think about it in common sense terms, if there is a significant time delay between the qualifying trigger and the defendant's reaction to that qualifying trigger, the jury might quite sensibly ask the question, well, is this an example of loss of self-control or is this really an example of somebody going away, cooling off, mulling over how best to seek revenge? Okay? So you need to be aware of that. So when you're facing a criminal law question and there appears to all intents and purposes to have been some sort of time delay, there'll be an expectation by the examiner that you do address this. Okay? One thing that I would like to mention at this juncture, and it's a question that I often get asked in tutorials, is how 
really to deal with case law in the context of a problem question. Okay? And what I say to my students is that wherever possible, you really need to be supporting each argument, each proposition of law, with a relevant authority. Now, what that doesn't mean is you don't want to provide an essay question response. Okay? What you want to do is where you're putting forward an argument, for example, that in order to run the defence of loss of self-control, there needs to have been a loss of control. Your way of supporting that statement would simply be to say section 54 okay, of the Coroners and Justices Act 2009. And that's your authority. And that enables the examiner to see that not only do you know the principle, but you know the authority, you know the source of that principle of law. Okay? And it will enable the examiner to be more generous as they're working through um, your response. Okay? So it is important, as I say, when you are looking at these pro problem questions, just to look for that potential for there to be some sort of time delay between. And I think in the problem questions that we've got uh, in the tutorial afterwards, there might be one issue in relation to a time delay that we can talk about in a little bit more detail. Okay, qualifying triggers. This is significantly new. There are essentially two qualifying triggers. Either or both of them need to be satisfied. And if they're not satisfied, it's quite simple, the defence is going to fail. Okay? So... The first qualifying trigger is fear. Fear of serious violence, okay? So section 55.3, where the defendant's loss of self-control was attributable to the defendant's fear of serious violence from the victim against the defendant or against another identified person. I know that you probably haven't come on to um, self-defence at this juncture, have you? You're not quite on to general defences, I would imagine, at this point in the course. So what I will say is quite, when you come back and you look at this area as part of your consolidation process, you will see that there are some similarities, some parallels with the law of self-defence. The main thing that you need to watch out for in terms of the examination is the detail of the question. There was a question very, very recently um, uh, in one of the examination, uh, I think possibly last year or the year before, where students were explicitly told not to consider self-defence. Okay? And a great many students went on to consider self-defence in a good deal of detail. And actually, some of that detail was absolutely excellent. Unfortunately, because the examiner had stipulated, do not consider self-defence, all their very good work didn't attract any marks or merit, okay? So make sure you pay special attention to that last bit, probably in bold, that tells you what you've got to be considering, okay? Right, so that's the first qualifying trigger, okay? This is the fear trigger, if you like. The second trigger is the anger trigger, I suppose, which is where the defendant's loss of self-control is attributable to a thing or things done or said, or both, okay, which constituted circumstances of an extremely grave character and caused the defendant to have a justifiable sense of being seriously wronged. Okay? Now, this does bear some similarity to the law in relation to provocation, the old law in relation to provocation. Okay? However, Whereas under the law of provoca uh, provocation, anything said or done could act as a qualifying trigger effectively, what you can see here from the legislative framework is that it's restricted to things of an extremely grave char uh, character. So trivial things aren't going to be sufficient. Okay? But they also have to have caused the defendant to have a justifiable sense of being seriously wronged. Okay? Um, and I guess that that last element um, under Section 55.4 really is a fairly objective evaluation, isn't it, in terms of, you know, would the normal person have felt seriously 
you know, wronged in the context, in the circumstances. Okay? So, the next thing you need to be aware of is that it is entirely possible to have a combination of those two triggers. And you will, at some point, come across questions or, when you're out in practice, situations in which there's been a combination of things said, things done, and an element of violence or perceived violence. Okay? So a combination of the two is fine. Okay? So, in terms of um, the first qualifying trigger, the fear trigger, if you will, that has to be a fear of serious violence, uh, serious violence from the victim to the defendant or an identified person. So it shouldn't be just people in general, okay? Maybe a person, maybe persons, but they have to be identifiable. Now, as is always the case, there's a general rule, and you have the general rules in terms of the qualifying triggers, but what you also have is some limitations that are placed on those general rules, if you will. Okay? Um, and in terms of the statutory exclusions, section 55.6 stipulates that a defendant's fear of serious violence is to be disregarded to the extent that it was caused by a thing which the defendant incited to be done or said for the purposes of providing an excuse for violence basically. Okay? So they've manufactured or created a situation in which they can use um, you know the circumstances to justify their violent response. Um, the next statutory exclusion is that a sense of being seriously wronged um, by a thing done or a thing said is not justifiable, again, if the defendant incited the thing to be done or said for the purposes simply of providing an excuse to commit violence. Now, the other mo really quite significant um, change here is that when we're looking at cases involving sexual infidelity where one partner has cheated on another, um, you can see a statutory exclusion here. Um, the Law Commission and the government have taken the opinion that actually sexual infidelity should never um, provide an excuse or a justification <coughs> for murder. I don't know whether that perhaps says something about what the government perceive as the level of sexual infidelity um, within society, um, but it is notable that this is on a statutory footing now and it is excluded. Okay? Um, the sorts of questions you're likely to face in the exam are likely to be situations in which there will be uh, elements where perhaps you've got partners involved and accusations have been made in relation to sexual infidelity, but sometimes sexual prowess as well provides quite a good examining ground for examiners. Um, can I come back to questions just at the end, if that's all right, just to make sure that we get through the substantive material for the lecture? Um, okay, so we've got the statutory exclusions there. Okay, and you're aware of what the key constituent elements are in order to raise this defence or run with this defence. The next bit that you need, or the next ingredient, if you like, is the objective test or the objective um, evaluation. Okay, now under section 54 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. Uh, there is an objective test, and that was similar under the law of provocation as well, where there were objective elements. The reasonable person um, has been replaced by the ordinary person. I'm not sure how many of you feel that that's a significant development or has necessarily clarified things for you, um, but there has been a change in that regard. Um, there is also explicit reference within this particular uh, element or ingredient of the partial defence with reference to the defendant's age and sex. And that really puts the decision in Camplin um, on a statutory footing. Um, you'll also note that it makes it quite clear, the statute makes it really quite clear that we're talking about a person with a normal degree of tolerance here, <coughs> a normal degree of self-restraint. So we've got 
um, a codification really of the decision in Holly here. The jury are required to examine the circumstances of the defendant rather than the characteristics of the defendant. Okay? Once again, we need, in the interests of completeness, to make sure that we address the issue in relation to burden and standard of proof. What's the but who, who bears the burden of proof in a criminal prosecution? Yeah, so the, the prosecution, the Crown, the CPS, bear the burden, okay? So it's their job to prove, and, uh, and to what standard do they have to demonstrate to the jury? Okay, so the burden rests with the Crown, and they must demonstrate beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did whatever the defendant is accused of having done. Okay? What we can see here once again in terms of this partial defence of loss of self-control is that there's a change, there's a significant change. In this respect, we have the defendant bearing an evidential burden in respect of the defence. Okay? So only where, in the opinion of the judge, a properly directed jury could reasonably conclude that the defence might apply, um, then only in those circumstances should it be left to the jury to consider um, the details of the partial defence. Provided that this threshold requirement is met, the burden of proof then rests on the prosecution to demonstrate that the... Um, uh, that the defendant did not, was not suffering from a loss of self-control, okay? So what you can see is the burden of proof and the standard, standard of proof, get my words out, differ in relation to diminished responsibility and loss of self-control. And what you want to make sure is that you get those right. That should be sort of your wrap-up to dealing with those partial defences when you're dealing with an examination question or alternatively when you're working through um, examination questions or problem style questions just to consolidate your knowledge and understanding. So an awful lot of material thrown at you very, very early in the morning so far. Um, I'm glad to see that the people that have flown in from uh, far-flung destinations are still with us, still conscious, which is great. Well done. Um, what I want to do is just summarise some of the tenets that we've covered in this lecture. I do appreciate the pace has been quite brisk, but also it's quite technical. There's lots of you know, uh, statutory uh, provisions there which sort of need to be worked through. The key here, the thing that I really want you to get from this lecture, is that actually it's all about being methodical. Okay? Actually, when students approach criminal law questions in a structured and methodical manner, they tend to do quite well, okay? Because what you're doing is you're ticking boxes as you're moving through the question, okay? So we started off um, this lecture just by overviewing the law in relation to homicide, some of the definitions that we need to be aware of. Um, and we noted that the offence of murder is committed where a defendant kills uh, the victim and has the intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. And in the last session that we had together, we looked at mens rea in particular. We looked at intention and we looked at recklessness. Okay? We know that the sentence for murder is a mandatory life sentence. Okay? And that if a defendant is convicted of murder, the judge has no discretion. Okay? There are three partial defences. The partial defences are loss of self-control. Self uh, you've got two out of three. Well done. That's good for early. I, heard, I think I heard someone over there. Suicide pact. Okay, so we've got three partial defences. If a defendant successfully runs any one of those partial defences, it will have the effect of... Um, 
the effect will be that the defendant is convicted for voluntary, uh, that's a new word, voluntary manslaughter. Okay? That will untie the judge's hand, allowing the judge discretion in sentencing. Anything up to and including a life sentence. Okay? The important thing to note here is that unlike with general defences, okay, the defendant, if convicted and successfully run, you know, if they manage to successfully run uh, one of these partial defences, is not going to be acquitted. Okay? Okay. C can we do questions just at the end? Yeah. Okay. So, we've gone through, um, we've gone through those elements. I, I'm going to remind you once again, I do apologise for the repetition here, that you only use these partial defences in relation to a charge of murder. Okay? Do not be tempted in a moment of madness to wander on to discuss it in relation to other offences against the person. Okay? The partial defences are controlled or exist, if you will, under the Homicide Act 1957 as amended by the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. And I've just outloaded, um, outloaded, outlined those partial defences for you there okay, on that slide. So, hopefully... Having been through um, those points and having broken down those two partial defences into their constituent elements, rather than worrying about it as a whole, which can seem really quite overwhelming, um, you're at least able to identify the sorts of situations in which loss of control and diminished responsibility can be raised. Okay? You can also, hopefully, identify the various ingredients. So we've got four ingredients for diminished responsibility, and we've got three constituent elements when we're looking at the defence of loss of self-control. Okay? If you work your way in a logical, you know, work your way through those ingredients in a structured way, one by one, you're going to pick up the marks, you know, uh, uh, in terms of applying the law to the question that you're facing.